Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to be discussing a very important subject. It will be broader than this. This presentation will be used only for part of the class. The topic of today's class is the development of international law by international courts. So, depending on the time, we'll try to cover several aspects. What's the few words about judicial settlement as a means for settling international disputes in order to set it apart from other means which are employed under international law to settle disputes between states? What's the few words about the role of the International Court of Justice in the settlement of international disputes and in the development of international law. Then we'll move on to other uh, forms of judicial settlement that exist under modern international law. That is, we'll look at a couple of other uh, international judicial and crazy judicial bodies to see the technical, the methodological differences between the ICJ on the, one, on the one hand and them on the other hand. And if we have time, we'll say a few words about uh, international criminal law and international criminal courts. Because international criminal law is one particular area where judicial bodies have played and will continue to be playing an important part in the development of international law. And in addition, international criminal law always goes hand in hand with international humanitarian law. And we will have a class of international humanitarian law. So I hope that in that sense, uh, that part of the class of international criminal law uh, should be an introduction to international humanitarian law. So, the, the Charter of the United Nations contains a few articles about the Pacific settlement of international disputes. Disputes do arise between states. It is a fact. It is a normality. It is abnormal when disputes degenerate into violent conflicts. However, it is normal for disputes to arise. It can be disputes about facts, about circumstances, about rights and duties, about their interpretation, about the interpretation of treaties and other obligations of people under international law. But as such, a dispute is nothing bad. What could be bad is the management of the dispute. So, to manage disputes, the Charter of the United Nations offers states, or rather codifies, because, of course, the means for settling international disputes that are listed in Article 33.1 of the Charter had, had existed before the Charter. So, Article 33.1 of the Charter of the United Nations lists a number of means for settling disputes that may arise between states, such as negotiation, Inquiry, medi mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements, or other peaceful means. So you see, this list is not closed. It means that states may, if they please, uh, resort to other means to, to settle differences that may arise between them. What is important the purpose of this class is that a variety of these means that are listed in Article 33 can be grouped under two categories, under two headings. Some means are essentially political, others are essentially legal. What's the difference between them? Well, essentially political means relate to essentially political disputes. That is, disputes about, in, about the interest of states that can be settled 
by other means, arguably more efficiently and more quickly, rather than by arbitration or judicial settlement. In turn, essentially legal disputes concern matters of international law. And in order for these disputes to be resolved, result must be had to sources of international law which apply uh, in the respective relations between the respective states in a respective dispute. Thus, political disputes are essentially to be settled by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, and good offices. Sorry. I was not supposed to do that. What's negotiation? Negotiation consists in a direct contact between the disputing parties with the aim of the peaceful settlement of the conflict. That is, if two states have a, have a dispute, they enter into negotiations, into a direct contact to discuss all the circumstances of the conflict and to try to find suitable solutions. Let me now ask you, which advantages and disadvantages do you see in the process of negotiation as a mechanism for settling international disputes? What is convenient and less convenient about negotiation? What is uh, appropriate and less appropriate, in your view, about states negotiating to settle conflicts between them? Let's, let's focus on advantages for the time being. What are the advantages of negotiation, in your opinion? If you and I are states and we have a conflict, what's good about us negotiating? Uh, I think it's good because uh, we can uh, uh, resolve it and uh, find uh, this is the way that it's uh, good for both the states. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is very important. In the, in the end, the best, the best solution is one which suits all sides in, uh, in a dispute. If a solution is found that only suits one side, well, the other side might be, might be unhappy. And the conflict may re-emerge. It can, it can arise again. And the good thing about states negotiating is that States directly affected, they know all the circumstances of a dispute better than anyone else. And because they have that knowledge, they are better positioned, they are better placed than anybody else to find an appropriate and mutually suitable solution. Thank you very much. In my opinion, uh, telling your like, problems of the state out loud can resolve the main problem. Mm -hmm. So you can define which uh, moments uh, are not suitable for your state and tell it to another party and uh, maybe another party um, was not um, confident about uh, what what is problematic for you so um, telling problems out loud will can uh, can help resolve the problem actually thank you indeed uh, the most difficult thing is to put a problem on the table and to start talking about it. Uh, many conflicts degenerate because, into problems because states hope that they will be resolved just like that, without negotiations. Sometimes it is difficult to simply start talking to one another. I think that the advantage of negotiation over the other forms of settlement of the disputes is that it is without any lengthy and overcomplicated procedures, um, considering the absence of the third party and the whole legal rules or any rules that regulate that they should do this and after this. So they basically find the way of communicating that is important for each other without any overcomplicated procedure. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, negotiations are 
a, a mechanism which is less formal than some, than some other forms of settling international disputes. Of course, there are procedures, there's a protocol to be followed, but as such, it is less formal than, for example, judicial settlement. Uh, another positive aspect about negotiations is that quite often sensitive and confidential issues are involved. And so the participation of a third party that you have mentioned might not be desirable at all. States might want to keep some issues for themselves only. That's another advantage of negotiations. and then we'll move on to consider the disadvantages of negotiations. One of the advantages of negotiations is that it is absolutely liberal for the parties to decide on only cases that are suitable for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Indeed, negotiations uh, allow for a space for discussion. They can be quite flexible. They can start with a specific issue, but then if other related issues emerge, parties are free to add those issues to the agenda and to resolve them as a package with the initial problematic, uh, problematic issues. What about disadvantages of negotiations then? What uh, complications or problems do you see related with negotiations? Oh, let me come back. Indeed, in, uh, negotiations can fail, and if they fail, oh, no solution will be found. Uh, the, the very fact that negotiations begin does not mean that they will be successful. Uh, negotiators must be professional, they must, of course, uh, be constructive, and not simply push for the positions of their respective states. Uh, on, only constructive nego uh, negotiations are good, otherwise, otherwise they can simply be stuck. Anything else? What could potentially be other problems about negotiations? Thank you. And it's interesting that it's you who said this, because in your previous statement you said that the absence of a third person was, a, was an advantage. So, this very circumstance can be an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on the circumstances. So, the, particip the participation of a third person in the process of settlement uh, Makes other, makes some other forms of, uh, or some other means for settling international disputes specifically possible. One of such forms is mediation. Mediation consists in that a mediator assists the parties to negotiate a settlement. Mediation is about negotiation between parties, but with the participation of a third person who assists in that process. The mediator structures negotiations, offers a timetable, uh, looks over the dynamics of negotiations, uh, helps them proceed more quickly or 
less quickly if circumstances so require. And importantly, a mediator is a neutral third party. He or she facilitates the process, but the ultimate decisions are, of course, up to the parties concerned. Next. Conciliation is another mode which involves a conciliator, and the role of a conciliator is much more active, much more proactive than that of a mediator. A conciliator seeks to lower the tensions between the parties. He or she improves communication, that is, if the level of tensions becomes high or threatening, a, the conciliator has to step in in order to lower the, the passion. The conciliator has the right to interpret issues which may arise in the process of, uh, of negotiations between the parties. He or she encourages the parties to explore potential solutions. So this already is the key difference between the role of a mediator and a conciliator. A conciliator does encourage parties to to explore potential solutions and offers such potential solutions. And finally, the conciliator suggests to the parties mutually acceptable outcomes, options of such outcomes. You see, here the role of the third party is much more significant than in mediation. Which of the two modes do you like more and why? Thank you. However, it is also important for a conciliator also not to cross the line. Uh, conciliators must be so professional and so sensitive to the dynamics of the process as not to cross the line, because ultimately the, the decisions are up to the parties. Yes, the role of conciliators is much more significant than that of mediators, but the ultimate decisions are up to the parties to dispute. That must be remembered. Good officers are also mentioned in Article 33.1 of the UN Charter, and they are peculiar in that good officers are often offered by uh, individuals or organizations that possess an expertise in a given thematic area. To give you a vivid example, the International Committee of the Red Cross is well known for providing good officers to parties to armed conflicts uh, because it is neutral, because it is trusted for its impartiality, because it is accepted that the International Committee of the Red Cross would never enter into any disputes of a political or religious, uh, religious nature. So the, uh, the ICRC is a good example of an institution offering good officers in, in situations of international and non-international armed conflict. Essentially, good officers are about assisting in establishing contact or beginning direct negotiations. Uh, this factor is crucial. Sometimes conflicts are so grave that parties simply do not want to talk to each other. They, they would not agree to sit down together at a table and to start talking to one another. So, uh, in such cases, it, it may be very helpful for a recognized authority, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, to talk to one party to a conflict, to talk to another party to a conflict, to take their respective messages, 
to convey those messages to, to the respective counterparts and thus maybe to facilitate the very beginning of a contact between them. You know very well what arbitration is. Arbitration can be done by permanent arbitration bodies or else it can be, it can be done by ad hoc arbiters who are appointed by the, by the parties to, to dispute. Uh, arbitration does resemble to judicial settlements. In some ways it differs from judicial settlement in other ways. Um, in your opinion, whichever is better, whichever is more convenient, whichever is more comfortable, arbitration or judicial settlement, and why? And thus we are uh, gradually approaching to the issue of judicial settlement. Background education. Background and dedication, and it's more simple to form arbitration, and uh, arbitration resolving of disputes is uh, quicker mm -hmm. than judicial. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, sometimes more is required than only the knowledge of law. Uh, the knowledge of some specific issues from other subject areas might be necessary to settle a dispute successfully and arbitration uh, is, a, is an appropriate means exactly because of that. Can I have more opinions in this part of the hall, please? I'm, I see your hand. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Arbitration can be cheaper indeed, uh, with the reservation that arbiters can sometimes prolong the process artificially because they're paid by hours. So arbiters may want to prolong the process, and that, that could be a disadvantage. Thank you. Indeed, as for time and money, uh, both resources must be used reasonably. In, and if they are used reasonably, then arbitration could be a better, a better means in comparison to, to judicial settlement. Excellent, because uh, judicial materials of judicial settlement are usually public. Um, considering the public international law, but for example, in the international law, 
the obvious anti-realization study, the uh, legal system of both parties that are to the arbitration, so basically any legal system, and apart from that, they should study the legal system of the seat of the uh, arbitration tribunal for them to judge. So I think that sometimes it can be even more lengthy, but at the same time, the level of efficiency, and, I mean, professionality uh, is, is higher. Exactly. No. Nothing to add. And thus we have approached judicial settlement. Judicial settlement is done at the international level by the International Court of Justice and by other international courts and tribunals. That is, there currently exists a number of international judicial bodies some with a general competence, some with a special competence, a special competences, rather because there are many, uh, that settle disputes between states. The Jessup competition is about the International Court of Justice, and so you will be focusing on, the, on this International Court. Please take your time to read the statute of the International Court of Justice. You will definitely do that for the competition. Please take some time to become acquainted with the rules of procedure of the, of the court. You will do that and will not spend much time on this, on this now. What is important for us within this limited time frame is to consider two things. First, are the issues which are within the competence of the International Court of Justice. Article 36, paragraph 2 of the ICJ statute lists four types of issues which are within the competence of the ICJ. The International Court of Justice may be called upon to interpret a treaty which applies to a dispute between the parties Secondly, it is empowered to deal with any question of international law. That is, the court may invoke any rule of treaty law, of customary international law, any appropriate general principles of law, as we discussed yesterday, in the settlement of disputes between states. The court may be called upon to establish the existence of facts which, if, if they are established, would constitute a breach of an international obligation of, of a state in question. Naturally, if one state brings a claim in the International Court of Justice against another state, the dispute is potentially about a breach of the respondent state's international obligation be it under treaty law or be it under customary international law. So, the court has the authority to establish that uh, a rule of treaty law or of customary international law was breached by a respondent state. And fourthly, if such a breach is established indeed, then the court also has the right to identify the nature or extent of the preparation to be made for such a breach. Tomorrow we'll be discussing uh, the main rules applicable to the responsibility of states. So, uh, the content of subparagraph D will be the subject matter of our discussion tomorrow. So overall, the competence of the ICJ is about these four items. And uh, essentially, any decision taken by the, made by the ICJ uh, can be placed within, within, one, uh, within at least one of these, uh, of these four categories. The second issue that I would like to uh, discuss with you now is uh, the format or the, f or the formats in which the International Court of Justice operates. Okay. 
one uh, is, as you, as you know very well, are disputes between states. This is what we, what we have said now. Sometimes this jurisdiction of the ICJ is called contentious. That is, one part of the ICJ's juris jurisdiction is about contentions, disputes between states. If a state has a claim to make against another state, and the ICJ has jurisdiction with respect to that particular dispute or to that particular state, then oh, the process begins. Importantly, the, the jurisdiction of the ICJ, I mean, the contentious jurisdiction of the, uh, of the ICJ is limited. It is limited uh, by virtue of... Uh, it, is, it is limited some, somewhat thematically, and it is limited because not all states in the world have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the, of the ICJ. What do I mean by thematic limitations on the jurisdiction? Uh, some treaties, such as the International Convention uh, on, comb uh, <coughs> on uh, uh, Combating the Financing of Terrorism, provide clearly that a state may not directly bring a case in the International Court of Justice first negotiations must be held or recourse must be had to arbitration and only if negotiations and arbitration fail, only then may a state bring a claim to the International Court of Justice. So, sometimes even if the ICJ has thematic jurisdiction as with respect to financing, financing terrorism, it may be procedurally impossible to start a case in the ICJ because uh, other means of, of settling a dispute peacefully, such as negotiations or arbitration, must be had recourse to. And secondly, not all states in the world, by far, have recognized the ICJ's jurisdiction. You will certainly check the, the website of the International Court of Justice very often. Among other things, you will find a list of states that have accepted the ICJ's compulsory jurisdiction. Many, many of, the, of the states in the world have not done so. And there is, there is even a third limitation on the efficacy of the ICJ. Even if the court accepts a case or admits it, even when a even after a decision is made, the decision must be enforced. It is hoped that states accept and enforce the decisions by the ICJ voluntarily. But it might, it might not always be the case. If a state is powerful, if it has friends among the permanent members of the Security Council, it might well be reluctant to enforce a decision of the International Court of Justice. So, these are all limitations of this, of this court that should be taken into account. Do you have any comments about this? What do you think overall about the efficiency of the, of the ICJ? You participate in the, you intend to participate in the JESOP competition, and this tells me that you do believe in the efficiency of the ICJ. But let's uh, discuss it critically. What do you think about the efficiency of the International Court of Justice? Silence. Why so? Well, um, as you said, the international law works most of the time, but not all the time. So uh, the same can be applied about the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Like uh, its decisions are really useful most of the times, but sometimes, like the Nicaragua case, when the decision is simply uh, being not um, implemented, so, uh, but 
Nevertheless, uh, the court uh, states its uh, position mm -hmm. and uh, it interprets uh, the, uh, the, uh, the norms and uh, establishes uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the customs and other norms. So still, um, even if it, it's not that efficient um, um, as a result, uh, it can uh, provide a further um, uh, development, let's say, for the international law in general. Thank you. And it's good that you gave the example of the Nicaragua case. This, this case was one that I meant a couple of minutes ago when I, uh, when I spoke about the problem of enforcing the decisions of the, uh, of the International Court of Justice. If, uh, if the party to a dispute that loses the dispute does not want to enforce the decision, uh, the decision is to be enforced through the Security Council of the United Nations. And in that very case was about the United States of America that was and is a permanent member of the Security Council and certainly a permanent member of the Security Council would do anything to block the enforcement of a decision against, uh, against itself. But on the other hand, of course, the International Court of Justice is an authority in matters of international law and uh, launching a case in the International Court of Justice, as you have said, uh, has many advantages in addition to merely interpreting international law. Let us try to list some of those advantages. So why, why is it good for a state to have its case heard in the International Court of Justice? The interpretation and development of international law is one definite advantage. The International Court of Justice helps advance international law, not in the sense that it creates new rules of it, but in the sense that it interprets authoritatively the existing rules of international law and, well, and develops their understanding. The International Court of Justice helps uh, bring rules of international law into a doctrinal system. It, the court links the, the relevant rules of international law together and, uh, in, and helps states, or at least does its best to help states to, to find appropriate solutions in the end. What else? Why else are the decisions of the, of the ICJ useful? Yes, please. Well, sometimes the ICJ goes in the contrast with its uh, subsidiary role, such as, well, it's basically it establishes uh, the, uh, the tests, like uh, the effective control test in the Nicaragua. Uh, it also establishes, like, uh, the, uh, the presence of the international customer rule of law, like, uh, for example, uh, multiple use in the Deputy case, like uh, the criteria for the for the unilateral declarations in the nuclear test case. So basically, it can um, establish that, yes, there is law that regulates uh, these relations. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, anything else? While you're thinking, let me, uh, let me offer one more item. And this is stability. And it, the international system works well if it works stably. Uh, if it works without fluctuations like this. If there are no major surprises, uh, peace is a thing that 
that is about stability. Um, peace is not only about the absence of, com of a conflict, as we know. It's also about the observance of human rights. It's about um, the observance of values which are accepted in the international community. And the observance of such values is virtually impossible without stability. The system must be operating well on a daily basis, and the court contributes to this stability. How? It contributes to the stability of the international system in that it follows its, most of the time, it follows its previous decisions. If you analyze the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, you can find occasions when the court departed somewhat from its, from its previous decisions. But most of the time, the court does follow its previous rulings and thus contributes to the conservatism and to the stability of the, of the system as it was designed in, in 1945. Uh, there can be different opinions about this. It may be said that the world has changed dramatically since 1945, and it is correct. It may be asserted that the international system does require significant adaptations and changes to the new circumstances. It is correct. It may be said that international law as such is outdated in some respects, and the very charter of the United Nations is outdated in some respects. It is correct. But it is also true that um, departures from stability may be, may be threatening, especially in such a fragile system as the international system is. The international system is much more prone to instability than any domestic system, because in the international system there is no, inter there is no international police, there is not a single international court with a universal compulsory jurisdiction. Not even the ICJ's jurisdiction is universal and compulsory. Uh, decisions made by international organs are not easily enforceable, as we have seen. So stability is a good thing in the international system, and the ICJ contributes precisely to that. What else? What are the other advantages of the ICJ's operation that you see? And let me come, come here again. Gentlemen, I know you have something to say. Well, one of the advantages of ICJ is that the uh, jurisdiction of the court is based on the principle of consent, consent mm -hmm. of the state, so the, uh, so the court cannot, uh, the case cannot be brought for the court without consent of the state, mm -hmm. so, so it can be one of the advantages. I do agree. The consensual nature of the ICJ's jurisdiction is is important. If a state has agreed to the ICJ's jurisdiction, be it on a permanent basis or on an ad hoc basis, uh, it means that the state has would have agreed to the enforceability of the ICJ's decision against against itself. In in that sense, the, the nature of the ICJ is as democratic as that of, uh, of international law more generally. While you're thinking, let me give you another item. Predictability is important in international law. Because the international system is potentially unstable, it is crucial for states to foresee what might happen in the future, which decision 
is likely to be made by the International Court of Justice on the basis of international law. So, when a state submits a case to the ICJ, it usually expects what the, what the decision is to be like, potentially. Submitting a case to the ICJ is not a lottery. It is a uh, conscious political and economic uh, and legal move that a state makes in the anticipation to win. So, because the ICJ usually follows its previous decisions, because international law is conservative, and because, uh, um, because predictability is, I would say it is an unwritten principle of international law. You will not find it in, the catalog, in any catalogue of principles of international law, but it's there in the philosophy of international law. So the ICJ uh, does maintain this uh, functional principle of the international system and of international law, I would say. And it is good as well. If a state goes to the ICJ, it usually weighs up the chances of winning a case. And uh, uh, most of the time, decisions could be predicted at least to a good extent. Let's move on to, to a next aspect that I would like you to be aware of. Of course, this list is not closed. It, may, it, it can be continued. Let's, let's consider briefly the other part of the ICJ's jurisdiction, which are advisory opinions or the other part of the ICJ's jurisdiction is advisory. So the contentious jurisdiction is about, dis is about disputes between states and the advisory jurisdiction is about something else. What is the advisory jurisdiction of the ICJ about? What are the advisory opinions? that the ICJ issues. What are they? Um, the court basically states its opinion in respect to legal issues without implicating uh, the obligations on, on the specific states, but uh, the court uh, states its position in the general terms uh, and also, these advisory opinions are given to, on the request of the UN organs, for, for, for example, on the request of the, of the Security Council. Um, one of such examples is uh, on the use and the, uh, the legality or threat of use of the nuclear weapons of 1997. So basically, yes, it has something that's specific but in general. Thank you. I was going to offer you this very example with a slight reservation that that advisory opinion was offered not on the request of the Security Council but of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Indeed, the advisory opinions of the ICJ are about, they're not about specific disputes between specific states, but they are about matters of international law. In issuing advisory opinions, the International Court of Justice issues its authoritative opinions on various issues of international law. It interprets international law. It offers um, solid uh, interpretations different rules of international law that could and usually are taken into account by states. Let us discuss at some length the advisory opinion on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons that our colleague has mentioned. Uh, this opinion was issued by the International Court of Justice 
upon request from the General Assembly of the UN. And interestingly, uh, there were actually two requests addressed to the International Court of Justice. One came from the General Assembly and the other one came from the World Health Organization. The question was uh, as follows. Would it be lawful for a state to threaten or to use nuclear weapons in any circumstances? Again, would it be lawful in any circumstances for a state to threaten or to use, with or to, or to use nuclear weapons? The court accepted the request from the General Assembly and rejected the request from the World Health Organization. Can you, can you think why? Why was the request of the WHO rejected and not even considered by the court? Any ideas? Can be any ideas. I'm seeing smiling faces here. When people smile, it means they have something to say. And that is an excellent supposition. Uh, indeed, the World Health Organization does care about the effects of a potential use of nuclear weapons upon human health. But the court was strict in its interpretation of the WHO request. The court said, it's not up to you, the World Health Organization, to consider matters of the, of the use of nuclear weapons. The court considered that it was not within the competence of the World Health Organization to assess the legality or the illegality of, the, of nuclear weapons. Yes, the effects of nuclear weapons, of course, uh, do have a bearing upon, upon human health. But in a strict sense of, uh, of the word, the World Health Organization has, should have no competence or should have had no competence in the opinion of the court to assess the legality or the illegality of the use of nuclear weapons. Therefore, the WHO's request was rejected, but the General Assembly's request was admitted. And what was, what was the outcome of those proceedings, essentially? What did the ICJ say about the legality or the illegality of nuclear weapons? Thank you. If not you're done, ladies and gentlemen, please take your time to read this advisory opinion. It's, uh, it's a masterpiece of legal thought in the sense that uh, many ideas have, were articulated very clearly in this advisory opinion, such as uh, the harmful effects of nuclear weapons. The court cool state stated that nuclear weapons indeed were indiscriminate because they would target 
indiscriminately combatants and civilians. But nuclear weapons are inhumane because whoever were the victim of nuclear weapons, the suffering would be unbearable, the suffering would clearly be excessive to the military advantage anticipated. Uh, the wounds, if a person were wounded, would be incurable. Uh, most of the time, victims would simply die uh, without a possibility for them to survive. So, for all these reasons, nuclear weapons would be inhumane. Uh, moreover, nuclear weapons are harmful to the environment because they cause irreparable harm to, uh, to the environment where humans and animals live. Uh, the effects upon the environment would last for decades and decades, and the court gave other reasons for, the, um, for showing the incompatibility of nuclear weapons with current international law, in particular international humanitarian law. Yet, the court concluded, made a somewhat ambiguous conclusion. To be more specific, the court says it was not able to establish whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful attention in the extreme circumstances of self-defense, where the very survival of a state would be at stake. So that was an important qualification. The court did not stop at saying that it was not able to determine whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons was lawful or unlawful as such. But it did specify that it was not able to do so regarding the extreme circumstances of self-defense when the very survival of a, of a state would be at stake. Do you agree with this reasoning of the court? In your opinion, should a state be allowed to employ nuclear weapons if its very survival were at stake? Or not even in those circumstances should a state be allowed to employ nuclear weapons. I understand that now it is rather a question of the philosophy of international law, because the court said what it said in 1996, but what's, you, what's your opinion about nuclear weapons? Yes, and then I'll come to you. its role in the international community uh, to letting it um, be the way it is with its, the, the, the thing that this, the future of, this, of the state is at stake, but at the same time considering the harm that will be done to the environment, but at the same time the harm that can be even evaluated on the future as for the radiation and as for the, all the sufferings that will be done to the humanity as the whole and to the existence on the earth because we can never say that, for example, the use of the threat of uh, the use of the nuclear weapon will be a singular one so that, that there would be no response from the other state and uh, we, can, we cannot count that this will be the only use of, the, of this nuclear weapon so that there would, it wouldn't be the beginning of the nuclear war. So it seems to me, even in such circumstances, the use of the nuclear weapon should be prohibited. Thank you. And the, uh, an important question here would be, what is a state? How do we define a state? I mean, if uh, nuclear weapons were considered as a means to save a state uh, when its very existence, would, uh, when, its, when its very survival would be at stake, could we say that uh, the state as a legal construction is more important than the lives of people. And the people are, well, in legal terms, the population are a, cons a constitutive element of the state. Can we, can we say at all that if many people die within a state, then the state survives? I would, uh, I would argue that uh, multiple deaths 
of people within the state as a result of the use of nuclear weapons, well, were, would be an attack against the state, and the state as such uh, would be, would be enda endangered if nuclear weapons were employed. So, in that sense, the use of nuclear weapons might not be able to save the to save to save a state when it's when it's very survival what at stake. Uh, well, uh, the nuclear weapons is not a mere missile uh, because uh, they uh, they are results of an, of an atomic bomb are uh, are huge like for the environment for the people for the future generations and the destructions uh, uh, the disappearance of the whole cities mm -hmm. so uh, 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 these attacks uh, they uh, should be legal only in very and very um, um, specific uh, circumstances and um, uh, so the um, the degree of uh, these uh, circumstances are very high however um, for example uh, the, there are uh, specific uh, uh, circumstances for uh, on vacation of, of the self de uh, self uh, defense but still the states they somehow they find the way um, how to uh, uh, how to um, uh, how to abolish uh, the, uh, that rule so I think that uh, the nuclear weapons and their use uh, like I don't know what the circumstances should be um, in order to uh, to uh, to invoke uh, the uh, the use mm -hmm. of these weapons. Thank you. I wanted just to add that this case, this advisory opinion, can be considered as a strong and good example of uh, interpretation of uh, a self-defense matter. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can consider it as a bad example um, in comparison for human lives uh, but we have a really good example of using uh, self-defense matter mm -hmm. and uh, it helped us to resolve the um, problem with Sisters of the Sun mm -hmm. so this case is active it, it, it is used in many uh, in many cases in many um, disputes, resolutions, and uh, it was very useful, so, yes. Indeed, this advisory opinion was interdisciplinary. It involved issues of self-defense, of uh, international humanitarian law, and also of uh, the atomic law, because the very final conclusion of the court in that advisory opinion was, was significant. At the very end of the advisory opinion, the court said that uh, all states had a legal obligation, and it was not merely a political obligation, but it was a legal obligation to come together and through negotiations to reach a complete, full nuclear disarmament. That was the ultimate conclusion of the, of the ICJ. See, in, that, in, in stating this, the court went somewhat beyond the phrasing of the request that was addressed to it by the General Assembly. The General Assembly asked the court whether it would be lawful in any circumstances for a state to threaten with or to use nuclear weapons. The court gave a twofold answer to that. So on the one hand, it said, any use of nuclear weapons bless you would be unlawful because of its incompatibility with international humanitarian law. On the other hand, the, the court left the question open of whether uh, the use of nuclear weapons might help save a state in extreme circumstances of self-defense when its very survival would be at stake. But at the very end, the court made a firm conclusion that there was a legal obligation incumbent upon all states to, to reach a, com a complete and conclusive nuclear disarmament and that this obligation should be fulfilled sometime in the future. So 
So, uh, that was the development in international law that the court produced. It did not just provide an answer to the specific question that was put before it, but it did develop uh, an, an understanding of a very important issue in international law, that there must be a complete and conclusive nuclear disarmament in the future. Let us now make a two-minute break after, so for technical reasons, after which we'll continue. Thank you very much. Most international courts in the world settle disputes between states. The ICJ does so, and most other international courts, be it the court of the uh, European communities, be it uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, be it other courts, they settle disputes between states. You may be aware of uh, another interesting model of uh, international quasi-justice, I would say. That is the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization. You know about that, right? Uh, some say that uh, the dispute settlement body of the WTO might be the most efficient mechanism or international mechanism for settling international disputes. We'll not go into details now, it's not exactly the, the subject matter of this class, but if you want to, please uh, read about that. The DSB, the dispute settlement body of the WTO, is excellent in that uh, its regulations set definite time frames, they, uh, it is mandatory for all the parties. The jurisdiction of the dispute settlement body is not optional, but it is mandatory, so there's no way for a member of the World Trade Organization to escape from the authority of the GSB if a dispute arises. And the mechanism for enforcing the decisions of the GSB is, uh, is beautiful. It does not allow, even for the most powerful states in the world, not to comply with the decisions of the, uh, of the GSB. I'd wish that uh, all international courts function that way. It's not yet the case, but at least there is one good example. On the other hand, uh, international courts that have operated or are currently operating in the area of international criminal law, they represent a different model of international justice. Uh, it's a model with the involvement of individuals. There are also a number of international, international and regional human rights courts, the most obvious example of which could be the European Court of Human Rights, and you know about that much better than I do, I'm sure, because uh, the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has an authority with respect to Ukraine. It does not have one with, with respect to Kazakhstan. So for, for us there, the, Euro the European Court of Human Rights is more of a theory, whereas for you, it's much, much of practice. So in the European system of human rights, the role of the individual is, is crucial. In the European system of human rights protection, individuals, I would say, are subjects of international law. Special subjects of international law in that they have some limited international legal personality uh, in, in terms of enjoying rights provided for by the Convention and its protocols, but also in terms of individuals' capacity to bring claims against, uh, against states which are parties to the European Convention. So international criminal law is another example of, uh, of a branch of public international law in which individuals are subjects of international law, in that they have rights and obligations directly under international law, and in that the responsibility of individuals, on the other hand, is invoked directly under international law by 
uh, by international tribunals. I have listed here some of the most notable examples of international criminal tribunals that have existed in the past or are in existence now. Uh, I am sure that you know them very well. And we'll, we'll go briefly through this list in order to focus at the end on International Criminal Court. So international criminal law is a relatively new phenomenon in the history of international law. It began in 1945, after the Second World War, when the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals were established to invoke the individual criminal responsibility of some of the authors of the Second World War. The Nuremberg Tribunal had jurisdiction with respect to some senior military and civilian officials of Nazi Germany. The, the Tokyo Tribunal had jurisdiction with respect to Japanese senior military and civilian officials. Interestingly, the Tokyo Tribunal did not invoke the responsibility of the, of the Emperor Hirohito, whereas there's no doubt that the, uh, the Nuremberg Tribunal would have invoked the responsibility of Adolf Hitler if he had remained alive. Then, after uh, uh, more or less after those trials were completed, a number of trials were held under the Control Council Law No. 10. What was the Control Council Law No. 10? To put it briefly, uh, after the end of the war, Germany was occupied by the, by the Soviet Union, the United States, the United Kingdom, and, and France. And the Control Council was a joint body composed of representatives of these countries that was running the occupied Germany after the end of the Second World War. Uh, this collective administrative body issued a number of acts that had the force of laws, and the Control Council Law No. 10 uh, established a mechanism for criminal prosecutions of lower-ranking German officials for uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes against peace. You remember that both the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals had jurisdiction with respect to crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity committed by senior officials, respectively, in Germany and in Japan. The Control Council Law No. 10 established a mechanism that focused on Germany only and on lower-ranking officials. So not the, very, not the very supreme or superior ones, but their subordinates, who, who nevertheless played an important part in carrying out uh, the policies of Nazi Germany. The, the trials that took place under the Control Council on number 10 were thematic. For example, there was a trial of doctors who in Nazi Germany carried out medical experimentations uh, on, on civilians. There was a trial of judges who, under Nazi laws, uh, issued discriminatory and essentially uh, illegitimate verdicts against some against members of some groups of uh, of people, etc. Uh, the judgments issued under the Control Council Law Number Ten essentially focused on war crimes and on crimes against humanity. There were a number of trials on charges of aggression, but uh, in uh, many of these cases, defendants were accused because the courts agreed that aggression is a leadership crime that can only be committed by leaders of a state who were tried and convicted at Nuremberg and Tokyo, and, therefore, and their subordinates well, they had no real power to, to participate uh, efficiently in the mechanism of aggression. Therefore, here in these trials, most defendants charged with aggression, they were acquitted.
they were considered innocent because they, it was proven that they had no real power to contribute to the mechanism of aggression. Then there was a long, period, a long break in international criminal justice. That is, for nearly 50 years, no international criminal tribunal was established. Why was that? Because of the Cold War. Because once the Second World War was over, the former allies, well, started to conflict with each other. And it was not before 1993 and 1994, respectively, that subsequent international criminal tribunals were established to try some individuals accused of crimes committed during an armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda. Both tribunals oh, will not fall. Beauty is important. Beauty is important. <laughs> International law is also about beauty. It's, uh, it's about calling things with appropriate names. It's about phrasing things appropriately. International law is about aesthetics. Uh, so, and the role of both tribunals was crucial in the development of international law. Let me ask you, what is an armed conflict? This question is not by chance. It is related to these tribunals. How would you define an armed conflict in, in, in legal terms? Let me jump ahead and say that uh, the word armed conflict, this, the phrase armed conflict, appeared in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, but it was not defined there. So the Geneva Conventions did employ and do employ the phrase armed conflict, but don't define it. And it was only the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that defined an armed conflict in the Tadic judgment. The judgment of uh, Dusko Tadic was the first judgment issued by the ICTY, and it was in that judgment that the ICTY defined both international and non-international armed conflicts. Please find the judgment and read it. That is the definition. Thank you. That is the definition of an international armed conflict. Yeah. The ICTY also defined the non-international armed conflict. Please. Ah, yes. Exactly, you're doing a fantastic homework. Good job. So it was not, this was to show you that it was not until, until 1996 that an international criminal tribunal explained what an armed conflict was. Uh, certainly, there were doctrinal definitions of armed conflicts contained, for example, in the, in the commentaries to, uh, to the Geneva Conventions, edited by Jean Pictet. Uh, but the ICTY well, explained this notion of international, of international humanitarian law and many other notions, and was, both tribunals were instrumental in uh, interpreting the rules of international humanitarian and criminal law and making them up to date. Obviously, the Geneva Conventions were adopted in 1949, 
uh, they suited the realities of the Second World War and they were not quite corresponding to the realities of more, of more modern conflicts. So, to remedy that problem to some extent, in 1977, two additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions were adopted. We'll, we'll discuss this on Friday. The ICTY and the ICTR did, a, did an excellent job in making the theory of international criminal law and international humanitarian law uh, applicable to the realities of modern conflicts. And finally, we have approached uh, the most contemporary model of international criminal just justice, which is the International Criminal Court. When was it founded? Do you remember? The statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted in 1998 and it entered into force in 2002. So the International Criminal Court started operating in, in 2002. Uh, the founders of the ICC pursued a twofold goal. On the one hand, they wanted to capitalize on the pre existing experience of international criminal justice. They wanted to reinforce all that was done in the area of international criminal justice since 1945. And on the other hand, they wanted to remedy all the problems that were discovered in the area of international criminal justice since 1945. The Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals were criticized, among other things, for having been manifestations of the so-called victor's justice. The defendants at both trials said, well, these, these tribunals are not legitimate because they were established by victorious powers. They would not have been established if the founders had lost the war. Both tribunals so said, so that was the, uh, the position of the defense. Both tribunals uh, manifested ex post facto justice. That is, they were retroactive. They applied law retroactively. And it's not OK in the area of international criminal law. This problem also persisted with respect to both ICTY and the ICTR. Both tribunals were established subsequently, so after the crimes within their jurisdiction had been committed. By contrast, the International Criminal Court was established with a proactive jurisdiction. Its jurisdiction only began when its statute entered into force. It has no jurisdiction backwards. Likewise, uh, here, the jurisdiction, uh, the geographic and personal jurisdiction of all these tribunals was limited to specific countries and to specific individuals. In the case of the ICC, the jurisdiction is limited to the states that have ratified the Rome Statute and to the nationals of those states. So, uh, earlier in this class we mentioned the issue of consent and it is important. The, uh, the International Criminal Court is based upon the consent of states that have ratified the Rome Statute. They have accepted the, the jurisdiction of the ICC voluntarily. Yet the ICC is not without problems. Uh, it's uh, it is sometimes uh, accused of uh, uh, impartiality because all cases dealt with by the ICC so far uh, were involved defendants from African countries. There is a problem of the cost of the International Criminal Court. It's, 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 it's very expensive and the number of cases produced by the ICC so far does, uh, do, uh, does not correspond, according to some opinions, 
to the costs involved. But, uh, we might discuss these issues later if you want. Let us focus within the remaining time on the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. <coughs> so, the ICC has jurisdiction with respect to nationals of the states that have ratified the statute or with respect to persons who might have committed the crimes on the territories of the states that, that have ratified the, sta uh, the statute. The court has jurisdiction with respect to how many crimes? Ah. The ICC has jurisdiction with respect to four crimes. The first is the crime of genocide. What is genocide? It's the act of destroying a certain racial, ethnic, religious group, national group. So it's, uh, it's a massive illness that is based on the ethnic or racial uh, grounds. Thank you. Do you all agree with this definition? Mm -hmm. I don't. Because genocide is, it is a peculiar crime. Yes, most of the time it's a, it's, it's a mass crime, like, like genocide in Rwanda or like the Holocaust. But if you look into the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, and it's a convention that was adopted in 1948, and the definition of the crime of genocide contained in the convention was reproduced verbatim in the Rome Statute. Uh, was, the definition was taken word for word and simply incorporated in the Rome Statute. According to that definition, it's not an act of destroying. It's an act committed with the intent to destroy, and that's different. If a person kills another person, mutilates another person, transfers a child from one human group to another human group, or creates conditions, living conditions calculated to destroy fully or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group, then there is genocide. But the issue of intent is key here. So, theoretically, one single victim is enough in order for the crime of genocide to be there. So, usually, it is a mass crime, but in accordance with the definition, one single victim is enough. And, uh, well, not even a single killing is required. If, if there is an attempted killing with, a, with the intent to destroy one of uh, one of the four protected groups, fully or in part, then there is an attempt at crime of genocide. That's the essential difference between genocide and the next category of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity are, by definition, mass crimes, unlike genocide. In order for the crime of genocide to be there, one single victim is enough, or even an attempted commission of genocide against one victim is enough. By contrast, crimes against humanity are massive crimes. These are massive violations of the most fundamental human rights. If they are committed, in a widespread or systematic manner. Both qualifications suggest that crimes against humanity are massive, that they, involve, that they do involve multiple victims. Uh, the victims of crimes against humanity are civilian persons, 
Uh, the crimes can be committed in armed conflicts or outside armed conflicts. In, uh, all crimes are directed against the most fundamental human rights, such as life, health, human dignity, integrity, uh, the right not to be discriminated against, etc. And the, the crimes can be committed either on a widespread, in a widespread manner, that is, one time but against many victims at once, or systematically, that is, at intervals, uh, on several occasions, so that many victims are involved in the end. Are crimes against, for example, is the persecution of sexual minorities, genocide or a, or a crime against humanity? A crime against humanity? Why? Because usually um, the sexual minority is uh, followed by a group of people and it's massive. So this is an abstract um, notion, not a, not a specific person uh, is followed by, is prosecuted for example. So I think that it's crime against humanity and uh, this is because um, some, uh, so I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Your answer is correct, but for a different reason. Uh, the prosecution of sexual minorities would indeed be a crime against humanity for, for the simple reason that a sexual minority is not a national ethnic, ra racial or ethnic group. The, the definition of the crime of genocide only protects four groups. These four groups and no others. Uh, sexual groups, political groups, other so any other social group are protected by the, de by the definition of crimes against humanity. In Cambodia in the 70s, uh, there, was a there was a massive persecution of, of, of people wearing glasses. Just think of it. Uh, people were killed, put into, into camps, jailed, for the simple fact of wearing glasses. Look around and see how many people wearing glasses are here in this cluster. Do you know what the logic of the persecutors was? According to, according to the persecutors, people wearing glasses were intellectuals. And in that country, in those circumstances, intellectuals were not welcome. So it was dangerous simply to wear glasses. And it was definitely a crime against humanity. The third category of crimes within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court are war crimes. What are war crimes? Let me come here. Uh, in my opinion, war crimes is a crime which violates uh, general obligations of the nations, mm -hmm. which is free uh, of the competence, for example, of another person, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, special status of uh, uh, prisoners of war, and uh, we, uh, anybody, any combatant need to respect it and not violate the uh, rights of the, uh, for example, uh, this. Uh, the special status or uh, don't kill the horse of combat uh, and another, uh, another subject of, uh, uh, of war. So, uh, as I said before, uh, war crimes concerns the crimes uh, against the obligations uh, which, uh, are, uh, which established in Geneva Conventions and at all and all together in international humanitarian law. Thank you. This is, a, this is a very good definition. We'll come back to it on Friday. With a reservation that uh, war crimes are not limited to the Geneva Conventions. War crimes ge put generally are criminal violations of international humanitarian law, which includes the Geneva Conventions, but it, it is not limited to it. Uh, war crimes uh, is not only a violation of the Geneva Convention, but it's also the violation of uh, rights of the head, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, war crimes, it may be equal for the violations 
of war, rules and customs of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is war crimes defined like in the Rome statute. There is not only the uh, strict actions against uh, civilians or another party of conflict, there is maybe also only threatened to uh, civilians that uh, nobody will uh, stay alive or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. War crimes indeed uh, include criminal violations against the law of Geneva and against the law of The Hague. They, they can be committed both in international and non-international armed conflicts and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court contains a lengthy list of war crimes respectively uh, within the jurisdiction of the court respectively in international and non-international armed conflicts. I just wanted to summarize that uh, war crime exists when uh, customs of uh, war are uh, violated and uh, together with international humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. so that's it. Thank you. Uh, sometimes war crimes are confused with crimes against humanity. Uh, there are several grounds on which they are essentially different. Crimes against humanity, by definition, are mass crimes, Whereas a war crime can be a singular killing of a single prisoner of war, for example, or of a single protected civilian, and still this act would be, would be criminal. War crimes can only be committed in armed conflicts, by definition. They are war crimes. Whereas crimes against humanity can be committed in armed conflicts and outside armed conflicts. And... Uh, <clears throat> The last crime within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court that has to be mentioned is the crime of aggression. What's aggression? Thank you. Well, your case study for this summer school deals with the unlawful use of force and aggression is precisely about this. The crime of aggression is an individual act leading to an un unlawful use of force by one state against another state in violation of international law. Indeed, there is a resolution of the General Assembly of 1974 that defines aggression and many elements of that definition were incorporated into the new provision of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, why am I saying a new provision? Because in 1998, when the Rome Statute was adopted, the crime of aggression was mentioned as being within the jurisdiction of the ICC, but, it, but the statute contained no definition of the crime. The crime of aggression was only defined in 2010 at the first review conference of the state's parties to the Rome Statute in Kampala, in Uganda. Uh, the definition that is now contained in Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute is largely based upon that uh, 1974 resolution of the General Assembly. Uh, the ICC, and this is important, the ICC still has no jurisdiction with respect to the crime of aggression yet, because this jurisdiction has not yet been activated. In, 2000, in, sorry, in 1998, it was agreed that both a definition of the crime of aggression and the conditions for the courts exercising of jurisdiction with respect to the crime of aggression would be defined at a later stage. 
the crime was defined in 2010, and it was agreed that uh, the provisions regarding the court's jurisdiction with respect to the crime of aggression would enter into force at some later stage. It is expected that towards the end of this year, towards the end of 2017, uh, state parties to the Rome Statute would take the necessary measures to activate the court's jurisdiction with respect to this crime. Uh, maybe to help you to, to a certain extent, let me say that among the materials that I gave you, there is my book on the crime of aggression. I did my doctorate on this, on this crime. You may be uh, you may find the book helpful for the purpose of your moot court exercise. To sum up, international criminal law, so as you see, is a very different model of international justice compared to that of the uh, International Court of Justice. International criminal justice involves individuals. It is about protecting definite groups of individuals against certain crimes under international law. In that sense, groups of people, respectively the national, ethnic, racial or religious groups here, civilians here, protected persons here, and anyone uh, as regards the crime of aggression, because anyone arguably has the right to peace are protected against certain crimes which are defined under international law and which are directly justiciable under international law. On the other hand, international criminal law is about the rights and obligations of people who commit such crimes. So, international criminal law imposes upon such individuals a direct obligation to be held responsible for the commission of such crimes, but it also grants such individuals uh, rights to a fair trial. So if, if someone commits such a crime, he or she does have rights under international law to a fair trial. Uh, well, this right actually includes multiple more specific rights, and you know this from, from international human rights law. So international criminal law is a branch in which it is a branch that is concerned with international justice but it's also a branch in which individuals, natural persons, are special subjects. That has to be borne in mind. Our time is up, and I thank you very much for your excellent participation. <laughs>